Okay, well, I, I will start. It is recording, thank you. Okay. Well, I know that you all know a lot about butterflies, especially seeing some of the people who are on this evening, whom I've had butterfly class with and know that they know a lot about butterflies. But even those of you who haven't taken butterfly classes, um, I know you've seen programs on monarchs and you know about their impressive migration to Mexico. Or um, perhaps your children have raised painted ladies in the class at school. And everyone has seen Virginia's state insect, the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail, which is just a lovely large yellow and black butterfly. But you probably don't know nearly as much about moths. And that's kind of curious, given that there are many more moth species than butterflies. Moths are in the insect order Lepidoptera, and they share this order with butterflies. And this is the only insect group that has scales. There's about 160,000 species of moths in the world, but there's only 17,500 species of butterflies. And in the US, there are nearly 11,000 species of moths, but only about 750 butterflies. And the moths in North America belong to about 70 different families. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about moth physiology and life cycle. And I'm going to tell you the stories of a few moths that you might encounter around here. But, you know, I'm not going to get into much detail of all the 70 individual moth families. And I'm sure you're quite relieved because we'd be here all night. Most moths and butterflies differ from other insects by their ability to um, coil up their feeding tube, which is called a proboscis. And I'll talk about that later in the presentation. This is a chickweed geometer that uh, the Audubon survey group saw in one of the surveys and it was posing so nicely and here's its proboscis. You may be wondering how to tell moths and butterflies apart. One difference is that butterflies usually have clubbed antennae, um, whereas moths usually do not. And this is always true in our local moths and butterflies, but there are some exceptions worldwide. On the left is Henry's Elfin, which I saw with um, Gary Myers, who I know is on this call. And um, you can see the club antennae. And on the right is a boxwood leaf tire, which is a moth with unclubbed antennae. This is a picture of both a moth and a butterfly in the same shot. On the left, you have a um, spotted thyrus, and that um, is a moth. You can see it doesn't have clubbed antennae. And on the right is a long dash, um, which is a butterfly, a skipper. And that's a pretty small butterfly, so the moth is even smaller. But I think in this picture, you can see the difference in the antennae structure. Another difference um, between butterflies and moths is that most moths fly at night, um, gathering nectar at uh, flowers or eating overripe fruits, and most uh, butterflies fly during the day. But there are day flying moths, and many of them are brightly colored. This is an inornate pyrosta moth, and it's more colorful than most butterflies. Um, the caterpillar of this species is really destructive. If any of you grow salvia, you may have seen this butterfly's caterpillar, and it sort of makes, lays waste to your salvia. Speaking of caterpillars, that's the name given to the larvae of both moths and butterflies. They're frequently really distinctive, and in some cases, they're more easy to identify than the adults. Caterpillars eat voraciously to transform plant material into the tissues that they will need um, for changing into moths. And most moths, and butterflies for that matter, spend much more time as caterpillars than they do as adults. Pictured here is a morning glory prominent moth caterpillar, and it's resplendent in green and red hues and covered with intriguing patterns. Um, I want to point out that this particular caterpillar was on Rusty Moran's shoe when we first saw it. So uh, I know Rusty's on tonight. Um, the adult is dull brown with a few white splotches. I'm not going to focus much on caterpillars in this talk, but I might maybe be persuaded to do a presentation on caterpillars some other time. I know you're all familiar with monarch migration, but did you know that moths migrate also? This true armyworm moth is one of them. And um, it migrates north in the spring and um, south in the fall. But the idea behind its migration is so that it's in a perfect place to um, reproduce in the summer. Moth people divide um, moths into macro and micro moths. 
macro moss tend to be bigger than micro moss, but there are exceptions. Um, really what normally divides them is that micro moths are from primitive moth families and are usually more challenging to identify than macro moss. So on one night, um, night light expedition, I got both a macro and a micro moth in the same uh, picture. And this goes according to form. The, the small one is a micro moth, it's a maple calyptilia, and the big one is a fine lined gray, and that's a macro moth. Jimmy drew this excellent picture to uh, introduce us to moth anatomy. Um, like all insects, moths have three body parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Like all insects, they have six legs. Most moths have four wings, but some are wingless. The top two wings are called forewings, and the bottom wing pair are called hind wings. The head's features include antennae, compound eyes, and mouth parts. The antennae are the noses of the moth world, and with them, they can taste or smell volatile chemical substances, like the pheromones that the female emits to attract a mate. Males tend to have more elaborate antennae than females do because they have to detect those pheromones, and these are just little molecules floating in the air, so they have to be really sensitive. Antennae also aid in navigation, orientation, and balance during flight. And there are a couple of different kinds of moth antennae, and from top to bottom, we have bipectinate, pectinate, and filiform. The difference between the bipectinate and the pectinate is having the feathery structures on both sides of the antenna rather than just on one side. Primitive moths have chewing mouth parts, but most moth adults have a proboscis, which is a sucking organ suitable for lapping up nectar. And they coil um, them up when they're not in use because, you know, a mouth part like that could kind of get in your way if you're not using it. Many scientists theorize that the proboscis evolved as flowering plants became common, allowing moths to utilize nectar as a food source. But recently, um, there's been some fossil finds that show that some moths had a proboscis as far back as the late Triassic period, and that significantly predates flowering plants. So the theory on the moss that developed the proboscis before flowering plants is that it might have been a way to help the insects maintain water levels in a hot and arid environment. Whatever the origin, proboscises have allowed moths and butterflies to take advantage of flowering plants' nectar as a food source, and moths and butterflies are important pollinators of flowering plants. This snowberry clearwing moth has just left a flower and is starting to coil up its proboscis while in flight. And this is a luna moth. Its head is all eyes and antenna, but where is its proboscis? And the answer is, this adult moth doesn't have mouth parts. The adults live just long enough to mate and for the female to lay eggs, which is just a couple of days. They don't eat as adults. Moth eyes vary depending on whether the moth is day flying, and we call that diurnal, or night flying, which is called nocturnal. They have compound eyes, meaning that the eye is composed of many subunits, and those subunits are called omatidia. Most day flying moths have eyes that provide sharp vision and a good sense of movement, but they require good light in order to have this vision. Most nocturnal moths can't depend on there being much light, so each omatidium can collect light from surrounding omatidia. And you can see in the moth on the top how it's reflecting the light, but that's showing that the omatidia are, you know, putting light to each other. And that uh, reduces the sharpness of their vision, but they can function in, in a low light environment. So on the top left, we have a tulip tree, tree beauty, which is nocturnal. And on the right, we have a corn earworm, which is diurnal. Wings and legs are part of the thorax, and that's seen here on a wet red-waisted florella moth. Adult moths have six legs, and most moth species adults have wings. Some moths have tympanal organs on their thorax, although there are other moths that have the tympanal organs on the abdomen. And the tympanal organs help moths to detect bats and hear other noises. There's an awful lot of moths that don't have any tympanal organs at all, though. There are a few wasps or wasps, moths that are wingless. There are also some species like the fall canker worm where the male has wings, but the female does not. When I first saw this, I didn't know what it was, but it became fairly obvious 
as I looked at the body parts that it had to be a moth, but no wings. And wings are probably the most noticeable feature of most moths. They're obviously used for flight, which enables moths to forage, escape predation, migrate, etc. And they're also used in thermoregulation or controlling body temperature, camouflage, warning display, and intraspecies communication, for example, in mating rituals. So um, can you see the litter moth just to the left of center in this picture? If so, you've got really sharp eyes. If not, wings are doing a dynamite job of camouflaging the moth. And I don't know whether you'll be able to see my um, cursor, but there's the moth right there. The wings and the rest of the moth's body's body is covered by scales. And the scales are fairly detachable and that's kind of useful, for instance, when a moth brushes up against a spider web. Shed a few scales and you're free again. Some day flying moths have black scales that absorb the sun's heat, and scales insulate night flying moths against cold. Scales are water, water repellent and help keep moths from becoming too wet during rainfall. They also absorb bat sonar, which makes the moths less easy to detect and therefore um, maybe they won't get eaten. And the scales also provide the color of the moth, and that's why I use this slide of a close-up of a luna moth wing. Sometimes the color is um, from pigment, but color can also be structural, coming from the play of light on the surface of the scales. And this is based on the light principles of interference, diffraction, and scattering. Structural color is why some moths appear to be different colors, depending on the angle of the light hitting the moth. And Many moths have an organ called a frenulum that sort of locks the forewing and hindwings together when the moth is in flight, but not all moths have that. Moth wings come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Obviously, the moth must have enough wing area to allow it to fly. And on the left, we have a streaked coleophora moth, and it has really narrow hindwings, but the hair-like scale fringes that that arrow is pointing to uh, increase the wing surface area. Female moths often have larger hindwings than male moths of the same species because they need to support the weight of the eggs and sometimes also the weight of the male if it's a species that mates while in flight. The bog ligropia moth on the upper right has fairly large forewings and hindwings and the great plume moth on the lower right looks almost as though it has feathered wings. This is a polyphemus moth. It's just, it's just glorious. And it's named after the Greek god of the Cyclops for the eye spots on the wings, and those eye spots deter predators. This is a really impressive moth with a six inch wingspan. The final moth body section is the abdomen, and that contains reproductive, excretory, and glandular systems, and also parts of the digestive, circulatory, musculatory, respiratory, and nervous systems. In some moths, the abdomen also has the um, tympanal organs, and also scent structures. I mentioned before that many moth females emit um, chemicals called pheromones to attract a male moth. This is a male melonworm moth, and um, the melonworm moth is named because the caterpillars love melons. In fact, they're quite a pest. The feathery protuberances at the end of the abdomen are called hair pencils, and male melonworm moths and males of a few other species have them. And the hair pencils contain sex pheromones and the male uses them to arouse the female to encourage her to be receptive to mating. So although pheromones are more often issued by females, males sometimes do it too. Moths undergo complete metamorphosis from egg to caterpillar to pupa to adult moth. Most moths are herbivores, meaning that they eat plants and moths and flowering plants have co-evolved. A few moth species caterpillars eat animal products, including the closed moss caterpillar, which eats wool, fur, and feathers. And here we have some moth eggs that were laid on a fence at Meadowood Special Recreation Management Area in southern Fairfax County. Most moths lay eggs on or near a caterpillar food source, and they're usually fairly well camouflaged. The reason I was able to spot these is they are not well camouflaged, and I really don't know what the moth was thinking laying them there. I'm suspecting they didn't do well. This is a little more typical. A tussock moth laid her eggs on the remains of her cocoon. The eggs hatch and become caterpillars. Some caterpillars eat the remains of their eggs and that provides nutrients, 
but many caterpillars go immediately to the leaves of the plants that will nourish them. And some caterpillars depend on one specific host plant, um, but other caterpillars like this one, which is a red humped caterpillar, are generalists, meaning that they can feed on a lot of different species. Caterpillars have chewing mouth parts and their main purpose is to eat and grow large enough to molt their external skeletons several times before pupating and becoming an adult moth. You can see that this imperial moth caterpillar is slowly but surely stripping the pine needles off this branch. And I saw this caterpillar with Gary Myers. I know he remembers it fondly too. Although many moths are valued for their beauty and a few like the silkworm are useful in commerce, caterpillars are probably more destructive to agricultural crops and forest trees than any other group of insects. Usually we think about caterpillars feeding on leaves but there's some other feeding strategies. The deadwood borer moth caterpillar, as its name implies, lives inside decaying hardwood logs, feeding off the decaying tree. But recent research indicates they might actually be feeding off the fungi that is helping to decompose the wood. Caterpillars can grow to a thousand or more times the size they were when they hatched. This is kind of mind blowing. Like all insects, um, caterpillars have external skeletons so when the caterpillar is eaten enough to outgrow its skeleton, it attaches itself firmly to a surface, secretes a new soft cuticle under the old one, then detaches and slips off the old skin. And this usually takes between two and four days, and they're really vulnerable during that time. So this picture is a pawpaw sphinx caterpillar that has just shed its skin, which is that yellow thing in the upper right. It's kind of hard to imagine that that caterpillar fit in that skin. The intervals between molts are called instars, and most moth caterpillars have four or five instars, but that varies by species. And as I mentioned before, most moths spend significantly more time as a caterpillar than they do as an adult. Caterpillars have lots of enemies. Wasps catch caterpillars like this variable oak leaf caterpillar to serve as food for their young. Parasitic wasps lay ca eggs on caterpillars and their young feed on the live caterpillar. And this is a skiff moth caterpillar. Its colors blend in well on leaves, including the brown patches that mimic dead leaf tissue. The blue arrow points to a white spot on the um, caterpillar that mimics a parasitic tachinid fly egg. Tachinid flies usually won't lay an egg on a caterpillar that is already parasitized because there won't be enough caterpillar to feed more than one fly larva. So the white spot, at least in theory, helps keep the skiff moth caterpillar from being parasitized. However, the orange arrow is pointing to a tachinid egg, so the disguise apparently has some flaws in this particular case. And of course, birds love caterpillars. According to Doug, Dr. Doug Tallamy, it takes about 6,000 caterpillars to rear a brood of chickadees. Caterpillars do have some defense mechanisms. Many feed at night when most birds aren't active. And some, like the milkweed tussock moth caterpillar, protect itself by ingesting plant toxins, and that renders it um, unpalatable to vertebrates like birds. This caterpillar is brightly colored, and that usually alerts predators that it doesn't taste good. Other caterpillars disguise themselves. Here's a curve lined owlet caterpillar, which hangs from its host plant, Greenbrier, rocking back and forth, looking very much like dead plant material swaying in the breeze. The white blotched heterocampic caterpillar blends in pretty well with the leaf that it is on. And other caterpillars have toxin uh, containing spines like the saddleback caterpillar. I don't know if anyone else on the call has ever been stung by one of those, but it got my attention when I accidentally brushed up against one. This gaudy sphinx moth caterpillar seen in South Florida looks remarkably like a snake, which is a pretty decent defensive tactic. And some caterpillars, like this banded tussock moth, avoid predators by excreting a silk line and dropping off the branch that they are on. Here's one of my very favorite caterpillars, the decorator caterpillar, which is the larva of the wavy lined emerald moth, and it, it uses plant material as camouflage. It attaches the plant material to itself using silk that it excretes, and it replaces its camouflage every day. <clears throat> sort of like, you know, new outfit every day. And in the event that the caterpillar survives long enough, 
it is eventually large enough to pupate and it forms a co cocoon inside which it transforms into an adult moth that looks nothing at all like the caterpillar. I haven't found very many moth cocoons. They're usually really well camouflaged, like this just looks like dead leaves, but I, I know it is a cocoon. Finally, the adult moth emerges from its cocoon, pumps hemolymph or insect blood into its wings to expand them enough to fly, and then starts its adult life. This is a newly emerged luna moth before its wings are fully inflated. The main goal of an adult moth is to reproduce. Some like the rosy maple moth don't have mouth parts, so they only live a few days, which is just long enough to bait and for the female to um, lay eggs. There's one family of moths, Micropterygidae, that have primitive mouth parts and they chew on pollen and um, fern spores, but there aren't any local um, species from this family. Most adult moths that have the ability to feed use their proboscises to dine on nectar or lap up tears and other excretions from vertebrates. There's even one moth genus that feeds on blood, but thankfully we don't have any vampire moths in our area. And after I read that we didn't have any vampire moths in our area, I found out that the Canadian owlet, which I've seen as close as Thompson Wildlife Management Area, is in that genus. I have not heard about them drinking blood though. Some yucca moths actively collect pollen as they feed and carry some to the next flower they visit. So they are specialist pollinators of yucca plants, and this is an example of mutualism, where each party, the yucca plant and the yucca moth, benefit from the interaction. There are also ones in the same family that are called bogus yucca moths because they don't collect pollen, and I'm not sure because they look exactly the same whether this is a regular yucca moth or a bogus yucca moth. And this was seen at the pollinator garden at Merrimack Farm, which I would highly recommend if you haven't been there, or even if you have been there. Some moths feed on ripe fruits, such as these black witch moths dining on prickly pear fruit in southern Texas. But most moths eat nectar, like this corn earworm is doing. I don't often see moths nectaring, but that's probably because I'm not out taking pictures much at night. To attract a male partner, many female moths secrete chemical compounds called pheromones that can be detected by males at quite a distance. Most species have unique pheromones, but those with um, similar pheromones usually emit them at different times of the day or, or, or night so that they don't um, conflict with the um, other species. Um, here we have a pair of pearly wood nymphs. I, I think they're really pretty, but their um, strategy for avoiding being eaten is to look like bird poop. So they really do look a little bit like bird poop even though they're very pretty. The toad-like bolus spider has evolved to emit a synthetic moth pheromone to attract male moths of a particular species. When one comes close enough, she slings the sticky spider ball at the bottom of this picture at the moth, capturing it for her dinner. Each bolus spider species attracts a different moth species or set of moth species. I mentioned before that, you know, different moths are active at different times of night, so the bolus spider might emit different pheromones at different times of the night because they know when their target species will be out. Some, <clears throat> some parasitic wasps can also detect pheromones <clears throat> pardon me, and use this to find tasty moths or even tasty bolus spiders. And um, ornithologists have done experiments to see if in insectivorous birds, which are birds that eat insects, can detect pheromones and it turns out that some of them can but it has to be a much higher concentration of pheromone than would typically be emitted by a single moth. Adult moths have a number of other predators. Bats love to eat moths, and the eastern red bat is an important control of the gypsy moth, tent caterpillar moths, and other moths that are agricultural pests. Dragonflies and damselflies can um, enjoy a moth meal, and it, every time I look at this picture and I see the scales all over the damselfly's eyes, it just kind of makes me cringe. And here we have a jagged ambush bug that has skewered this yellow collared scape moth. I'm now going to tell you about several moths that you can see around here, and one that you can't see around here. Um, and they were selected largely because A, I have a picture of them, and B, there's enough known about the species to make it an interesting example. I mentioned previously that some female moths don't have wings. 
This is a bagworm moth, Abbott's bagworm moth, or at least the shelter that she surrounds herself with. As soon as the caterpillar of the bagworm moth hatches, it weaves a silk cocoon around itself and it lives inside that until it becomes an adult moth. And because, you know, it's not moving around, it needs to protect itself in some way. So it reinforces its silk cocoon with pieces of twigs, leaves, and other plant matter, and that is a good camouflage. The female remains in a caterpillar-like state even when she's an adult, and then she mates and essentially becomes an egg-filled sac. The male bagworm emerges as a free-flying moth, and it's hairy and charcoal black. I've actually never seen a male, um, a male moth of this, this species. Neither the male nor the uh, female adult feeds. The female lives a couple of weeks, but the male only lives one or two days. That's all the time he needs in order to you know, donate his sperm. When the female is ready, she emits pheromones to attract the winged male who inserts his abdomen into that silken case in order to mate. And after mating, the female lays her eggs inside the case and they overwinter here and hatch the following spring. Here's a slightly more common bagworm here. Um, oops, sorry, but get back, yes. Um, where you can see that the bagworm is partially emerging from its silken case. Some moths are toxic and advertise this via aposematic or warning coloration. This is an ornate bella moth and it's so toxic that if it gets in a spider web, the spiders will free the moth from, its, from the web. And the caterpillars of this moth get their toxic protection from their host plant, which is Crotillaria. Um, there's various species of Crotillaria, but they're members of the pea family. And the males convert some of the Crotillaria toxins to a related toxic compound. And when they mate with the female, they transfer sperm, nutrients, and scales saturated with the related toxic compound to the female. And this package of sperm, nutrients, and scales is called a spermatophore. The females can detect the toxic concentration of males, and they use that information to select males with the potential to donate the most toxins. So the more poisonous the guy is, the more the female likes it. Adult ornate bella moths live approximately three weeks, and at that time the females mate usually um, four or five times, but the, the most on record is 13 times, and each time they mate, they receive additional nutrients and alkaloids uh, as nuptial gifts via the sper spermatophores that the male donates. And those additional nutrients allow the female to lay a larger number of eggs than would otherwise be possible. The female contributes her own alkaloids and those received from the male, um, and that makes the eggs even more toxic, which means they're that much less likely to be predated upon. And here's another moth that advertises that it is unpalatable by its warning colors. This is an oleander moth, and as the name suggests, it feeds on oleanders, and it uses oleanders' toxic chemicals to protect itself from predation. And just as an aside, the toxic chemicals in oleanders are the same as the toxic chemicals in milkweed. Unlike most moths, the oleander moth female does not emit pheromones to attract the male. Uh, what they do is they perch on oleander foliage and emit an ultrasonic acoustic signal and it's above our level of hearing but it can attract male um, oleander moths from great distances and when the male and female are within a few feet of each other they begin a courtship duet of acoustic calls which continues until mating occurs two or three hours before dawn this moth you wouldn't see in our area um, because it needs oleanders so it's, it's common from South Carolina and further south. And this is a painted lichen moth. Um, the caterpillars live on lichens and blue-green algae growing on tree trunks, fallen logs, and rocks. This may convey chemical protection to the adult moth, which is brightly colored to warn predators away. And there are two primary predators of lichen moth caterpillars, predatory and parasitic wasps. And both of those are able to find caterpillars based on the smell of the caterpillar's poop. So the caterpillars have um, evolved an interesting defense strategy. They flick their poop over 30 body lengths away to confuse the wasps. There's a couple of skippers that do that too. Um, lichen moths have tympanal organs located on their thorax. 
They can hear bats and then make a variety of ultrasonic noises to confuse the bats. And they also, like the oleander moth, vocalize during courtship. The Eupatorian borer moth, like others in the Sicidae or clearwing moth family, gain protection by mimicry, looking like wasps or bees. This involves not only clear wings and a colorful banded abdomen, but legs with modified tufts that in some cases have yellow tipped scales to simulate the pollen carried by bees. And when I first saw this, I did think it was a wasp, but when I took the picture, I realized it was a moth. And here's one that I'm sure you've all seen, the Ilanthus webworm. It's native to Central America in the very southern tip of Florida. And it does look like, a little bit like a beetle, but it's a moth. And although it's called the Ilanthus webworm, its original host plant is a related tree, the paradise tree. And that's a plant that only grows in warm frost-free areas, which is why the native range of the Ilanthus webworm was Central America in the very southern tip of Florida. Ilanthus, otherwise known as Tree of Heaven, or by some gardeners as Tree of Hell, was introduced to the U.S. in the late 1700s, and it was considered at that time to be a beautiful garden specimen. The Ilanthus webworm was able to adapt to this new plant, um, which, you know, didn't stay in the gardens where it was supposed to and quickly became naturalized. And um, the Ilanthus tree survives well in colder weather, and that greatly expanded Ilanthus webworms range, and now we see them all the time in our area. This is the southern flannel moth, which is a nocturnal moth that is found from New Jersey down to Florida. It's called a flannel moth because it looks like flannel sheets, and it does kind of make me want to reach out and touch it. The female mates on the first day of her adult life and lays eggs in the two days following mating. She covers her eggs with hairs taken from her abdomen to help camouflage and protect the eggs from predation. This is another species that has reduced mouth parts and they don't feed, so they only live for a couple of days. And here's the caterpillar of the southern flannel moth, the moth we just saw. And it's said to be the most venomous caterpillar in North America. Those lovely hairs contain sharp spines that are filled with venom. And I saw several websites that suggested that this caterpillar resembles a certain prominent politician's hairstyle, but I'll, I'll let you be the judge of that. And this gorgeous creature is called the beautiful wood nymph. It gains protection from predation by looking like bird poop. And it really cracks me up that something that looks like bird poop has beautiful as part of its name. This is an imperial moth, which is striking against a white background, but it really blends well into autumn leaves when it's on the ground. You're probably wondering how you can find moths. The day flying moths are relatively easy. Just look on flowers or vegetation and you can see some. Um, today, midday, I was talking to Kim on the phone while I was hiking at Lisovania State Park and I noticed this brown leaf on an American holly tree. I decided to look, that's what the arrow's pointing at, I decided to look at it more closely and surprise. It was a grapevine looper moth. So you might want to look under leaves as well. And here's another picture of the same moth it always holds its abdomen that way, possibly because it does look kind of like a dead leaf and that looks like the petiole of the dead leaf. I'm not sure whether that's true, but I heard that some people think that. Night flying moths are more of a challenge to find. Many moths are attracted to UV light. So a couple of times a summer, I set up a light contraption, which you can see me here against. Ours is homemade. We used my husband Jimmy's art stands as the base, and then Jimmy made a wooden top that holds a UV light to fit on top of the art stands. You plug it in and drape a sheet over it, and the moths will come. And it's not just moths that come, it's wasps, beetles, fish flies, etc. And I like them all, so I just stand there and take massive numbers of pictures. Mercury vapor lamps are also good, but the bulbs, bulbs can get very hot, so be careful um, if you use those. And I've seen some moth setups that are powered off car batteries, and that allows you to set up in more remote areas. But a big challenge for me is that there aren't many places around here that are open at night. And it's probably already obvious to you that you will get different moths in different environments. Moths whose caterpillars feed on oaks are found where there are oak trees, and moths whose caterpillar feed on goldenrod will be found where there's goldenrod. In normal times, various parks have night activities, especially during moth 
week at the end of July. And I try to attend as many of those events as possible, but I get reasonable moth diversity even on my back deck. Different moths are found at different times of year. So the best evenings for um, attracting moths are warm, dry, wind-free, moonless nights. And um, in addition to lights, you can also use overripe ripe fruit to attract moths, but that can also attract yellow jackets, raccoons, etc. Or you can paint a sugar mixture on trees to attract moths. And there's lots of recipes on the internet, um, most of which involve stale beer. And I don't have one that I can recommend. Um, if you get one that's really good, let me know. And something that I read about but I haven't tried is wine ropes. And you use either thick cord or cloth made from absorbent material. And then you heat a bottle of cheap red wine in a pan, stir in and dissolve two pounds of sugar, and then soak the cord or cloth in the liquid. Then you drape the wine ropes over low branches, bushes, or fences just before dusk, and then later check for moss with the flashlight. Unfortunately, many moth species and other insects are in decline. Climate change affects everything, really, including moths. Um, habitat loss, degradation, and fragmentation is a problem for many things, including moths. Um, a lot of habitat has been lost to agriculture, resource extraction, and urban and suburban development. And even though sometimes these areas can be good for some species, there's an awful lot of species that require specific habitats and they're, they're screwed, basically. Light pollution, um, that can harm nocturnal insects like moths by increasing their susceptibility to predation by bats or birds when they're attracted to um, artificial lights at night. Pesticide misuse and drift from aerial spraying are a threat to moth and other insects, especially when the pesticides are persistent chemicals that remain in the environment for a long time before degrading. Non-native species and diseases that affect native species are a problem because many moth caterpillars depend on a particular plant. So if that ecological niche has been taken over by a non-native species or a disease has affected their plant, um, you know, the caterpillars don't have much food. And then air pollution, which I don't always think about as a problem for other than people, but when you think about it, if you have an insect that relies on scent trails to find flowers or to find a female moss, it's, it's a huge problem. So what can you do? Well, there's um, lots of citizen science projects um, by observing life around you and reporting it. You can help scientists. Birds, dragonflies, and butterflies are counted, but I don't know of very many moth inventories. If you report a moth sighting, you might be reporting the first in your county or the earliest date on record or whatever. And when conservation efforts are designed and implemented, the more data there is available, the better the result could be. Plant native trees and plants. You'll attract native insects. Try not to use pesticides. Be and be really prudent with fertilizer. Um, try to get your community to avoid spraying for insects like cankerworm or mosquitoes. Targeted elimination of mosquito larvae should be enough. And please turn off your lights at night if you're not using them. And finally, join and become active in organizations that support the natural world. There are many such organizations, but I will particularly mention the Prince William Conservation Alliance. Conservation Alliance, among many other things, promotes environmental stewardship, and they also sponsored this talk. So your support really helps. Other organizations that I also wholeheartedly support are the Audubon Society of Northern Virginia, and the Prince William Wildflower Society, which is a chapter of the Virginia Native Plant Society. And if you're interested in becoming more knowledgeable about nature in general and spending some time volunteering, consider taking Virginia Master Naturalist training. And to end the program, I'd like to show you a few green moths, which, because my favorite color is green, are my favorites. And this is a pair of Luna moths mating. Then clockwise from the top left, we have a red fringed emerald, a small mothy lithocodia, a smaller parasa, a green marvel, a black dotted maliatha, and a mottled prominent. And finally, my friend Larry Mead was kind enough to allow me to use his picture of the Pandora Sphinx. Isn't this a marvelous moth? I wish I had seen one. I, I haven't. 
So in this presentation, there's about 55 moth species from 19 of the seven, 70 American moth families in this presentation. That's a really tiny percentage of the approximately 11,000 moth species found in the US. I challenge you to go out and find more. And there were a couple of sources that were really useful in preparing this presentation. Moss, A Complete Guide to Biology and Behavior by David Lees and Alberto Zilli, and that's put out by Smithsonian Books. Caterpillars of Eastern North America by David Wagner. And Peterson, Field Guide to Moss of Northeastern North America. Now I'm done. Are there any questions? Thank you, Judy. That was amazing. I love the um, the story of the spider that mimics the pheromones of the, the moth and captures it. Um, so yeah, we'll open up to questions. And I did see that in the chat, um, Jenny Meyer would, uh, and I'm sure she's not alone in this, would love a presentation on caterpillars. So um, Perhaps we can get that set up. Oh, I'm sure we can just tune into our calendar page. It, it'll be a little while. I'm doing another um, presentation for the uh, Prince William Wildflower Society next month, and then I need a little break. Well, maybe <laughs> late winter. But thank you for getting ready for spring. Well, I have yes. a question, Judy. Is there any association between seasons? and which moths are present? Yes, um, that's an excellent question. Um, because so many um, moths are dependent on a particular plant, for instance, if you have a moth that depends on goldenrod, they're only going to be around when goldenrod is available for their caterpillars. Um, there are some moths that have multiple broods. Those typically would be generalist um, moths that can feed on various different things. So, yes, um, they do vary by season. So it would benefit you from knowing the host plants, Definitely. too. Good question. Uh, Judy, how do they winter? Are they winter more in their cocoons or as eggs? Or are there some that winter as adults? I'm not aware of any that winter as adults, but I suspect that there are some. Yeah. Um, I think it's most common to overwinter as eggs or as pupa. I do know there are some caterpillars that overwinter, though. Makes sense. Thanks for using my sphinx moth there. <laughs> that was an awesome moth. I, I mean, you had a lot of great moths, but that was the one that just said... That's one that popped out, yeah. I, I just walked out in the morning uh, to go birding, and it was just on the side of the motel. <laughs> cool. I was staying. Well, it's a great picture. Thanks. Yours are awesome. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody have a moth story they'd like to share or more questions? I have Any one. Moth I have, story? I have one too. Um, Go ahead. So I saw a, um, some moths look just like butterflies. So I saw one, uh, what did it turn out to be? Some kind of a black spear moth up in Maine. I was fiercely looking through my butterfly guide. I don't see this butterfly, I don't see this butterfly. Then I noticed, oh, it doesn't have knobs, it's a moth. <laughs> so, <laughs> figured well, out what it was. I did mention um, in the presentation that around here, that's always true, but there's actually one moth in Madagascar where I don't remember which way around it is, but the male has clubbed antennae and the female does not. So even in one species, one has clubs and one doesn't. But around here, you can yeah. always tell a moth from a I wonder why the one has it in Madagascar. It's odd. Is it trying to mimic a butterfly? I don't know. That's a good question. Huh. I have a question, Judy. Um, you mentioned the chickadee needs so many caterpillars to get to fledging. Uh, what percent of those caterpillars are moth caterpillars versus butterfly caterpillars? I don't know whether that's been studied, Phil, although I know that Desiree Narango, who was the one who was doing that study for Doug Tallamy, um, has a lot of data on it. Um, given 
that there's a lot more moths than butterflies. I strongly speculate that it's mostly moth caterpillars, but I don't I don't well, really... that, well, that makes me more of a moth fan then. <laughs> yeah. I, I would think it'd be a lot more moths, yeah. Thanks. Well, I got to say that um, when you think about that, you know, almost every yard has a nest of chickadees of how many caterpillars that is that they're finding, you know, in neighborhoods. And when I go out looking for caterpillars, <laughs> you can hardly find any. Well, actually, Kim, you know, you bring up an interesting point. Um, Doug Tallamy's uh, graduate students did a study um, to see where chickadees fledged most, and it was where there were native trees. So uh, they did a study in, in the Washington area. So plant native trees. So that's where they're, I got to climb up the trees to find them, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, didn't Doug Tallamy do something where he just walked around the trees and saw how many caterpillars he could see? <laughs> Oh, I'm yeah. sure he did that. Yeah, or somebody did that. But yeah, they found a lot. If you if you have an eye for it, I guess you can find them. <laughs> like Judy. Yeah. <laughs> Some right of the trees pretty tall for anyone of my maybe, maybe this maybe he had a ladder. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I, well, I gotta say, I love it in the summer when the Minarda is blooming and the clear wing moths are just everywhere. Yeah. Saw a lot yeah. of them this year. Kathy Arnold, I think, is trying to share a, what is that, a pupa with us? I'm not sure what you have in your hand. Katie, Kathy Arnold? Uh-huh. Oh, interesting. I can't see it. Oh, I guess I can. Oh. I'm not sure which one it is, but it's, it's beautiful. That's it. It's a hornworm pupa. It's a what? Hornworm. Hornworm. Hornworm oh, awesome. pupa. Thank you for sharing that. And we have another one. We oh. don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know the pupas at all. I wish I did. Yeah, that's that's. Uh... Well, that's pretty beautiful. And they're about to hatch too. Well, they're really close. Well, nice. Well, let us know what they are. That that would be excellent. Whenever I hear Judy talk or, or anybody else about about bugs, I, I think of the same the, the one piece of wisdom that I can produce about insects is that insects are the most valuable animals on earth certainly more valuable than humans, but uh, the most valuable on earth. Without insects, we would all die because the insects produce or help produce our food. And without them to pollinate, we're not going to have any more food. So those of us who can't resist spraying the hell out of some nest of bugs should think twice about doing that again because you're killing something that really means life to us. Plus, as Judy has pointed out, they are extremely beautiful. That's, that's yeah. my only wisdom I can produce. Well, thank you, Harry. Well, you're right. And there's a purpose for everything. In the ecosystem, it seems that the more that we find out uh, about nature and how it works, the more complexities there are and the more everything has a place in nature. Even humans? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. That's a, well, that's the whole thing with invasives is they aren't, they don't have a place. <laughs> they, they cause right. disruption. So, uh, right. Cause these, food webs have developed in our biomes over thousands if not millions of years and these invasive elements really disrupt it. So. Right. So, um, yeah, thank you for saying something about um, not spraying because that, I really think that's important. Yeah. 
Okay, well, I'm going to pull out. Judy was wonderful job. Good, good. You always give a good talk. You know that? Yeah. Thank you, Harry. Be well, Harry. See ya. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. All right. Well, thanks. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate your Thank you. Yep. I uh, hope to see you soon, Judy. Thanks, Judy. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, Judy. Awesome, Judy. Thanks, Judy. That was great. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Judy. <laughs> <laughs> see you tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Thank you for coming, everyone. Ashley, can you post the schedule of events again, please? Oh, sure. Um, on our website. Well, I think we're about to close up, but I can um, go ahead can go and share to the, the screen. Okay. Here we go. Just give me your website address, please. Sure. So the website is pwconserve.org. PWConserve.org. Thank you very much. It was excellent. Thank yeah. you. And you just go to calendar and you'll find it all there. Okay. Will do. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you. Well, I, I guess I'm going to go too since. Yeah. And we will yeah. shut down. We can just it's really leave good it to off. see you again. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Thanks, Ashley. That Thanks. really was a good presentation. Thank you. Yeah, it was very engaging. Well, I'm glad we recorded it. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I would have to do it again, wouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I would have been calling you up going, I'm so sorry. Oh, uh, no big deal. But okay. it, I see it, it's recording. <laughs> okay, I'm going to Thanks go a lot. Okay. All right. Bye. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. See you, Cam.